The 1950s were both a decade of American prosperity and increasing fear. The USSR had acquired nuclear weapons and the threat of an all-out war seemed a real possibility. No one wants another Pearl Harbor. This means that we must have knowledge of military forces and preparations around the world, especially those capable of massive surprise attack. How could America best protect its citizens? The answer, seize the high ground and monitor our adversaries from above. Surveillance technologies had advanced significantly during World War II in fields like signals interception, aerial photography, and the new technology on the block known as radar. But sending planes on spy missions was a deadly business. The safer option was obvious. Adapt surveillance technologies for space. But getting there was problematic. And they kept telling them, everybody they were going to put a satellite in orbit. And of course, it never worked. It kept blowing up on the pad. Until 1957, when Russia's Sputnik satellite launch ratcheted up Cold War tensions. And the Sputnik thing really upset people. That the Soviets, by demonstrating that they could launch something like Sputnik in 1957, uh, led to uh, many concerns that they may have a significant jump on us. The Cold War escalated even further when Gary Powers' U-2 spy plane was shot down over Russia in May of 1960, ending plane overflights. On display in Moscow, the wreckage of pilot Francis Powers' U-2 reconnaissance plane for Muscovites and foreign newsmen to see. But America was still determined to win the space race and launch the world's first spy satellites. Fortunately, the first signals intelligence, or SIGINT satellite, was mere weeks away. Engineer Reed Mayo had worked on radar detector units for submarines, which were mounted on periscopes. And as he uh, used to phrase it, it was kind of like raising the periscope up to 500 miles, because that was the altitude the satellite was going to fly at. The result was GRAB, launched in June 1960, which collected Russian radar sight signals. It was an unqualified success. It was low cost, it was safe, nobody had to put their life on the line. In a period of a weeks, maybe a month or so, learned more about the laydown of the Soviet radar picture than pilots could have ever found. Next up, the harder challenge of gathering imminent or imagery intelligence from space. The project codenamed Corona featured a who's who team of scientific experts to overcome the challenges of acquiring high quality photos from space. And there were a lot of people who said, you're not going to do this, this is a pretty complicated thing. Furthermore, since the images couldn't be transmitted electronically yet, the film had to be physically returned to Earth. The team built heat resistant buckets equipped with parachutes which could be dropped from orbit to be caught in mid-air by specially trained pilots. There were many obstacles to overcome. But on August 18, 1960, the NRO's 14th Corona mission successfully collected the first photos of denied Soviet territory from space and returned the film safely. It was amazing. I, I mean, this was a can, one roll of film. But it had more information in it than all of the U-2 uh, put together. These successes continued, leading to the consolidation of the varied reconnaissance programs into one centralized agency, the National Reconnaissance Office, officially established on September 6th, 1961. That was a very exciting period because um, it looked as though some major things were going to happen. Rounding out space surveillance technologies, the NRO even gathered the world's first radar imagery from orbit in 1964, using a special satellite codenamed QUIL. We had managed to demonstrate that uh, you could build radars, side-looking radars in satellites, and they would work just like they did on the ground. The National Reconnaissance Office had successfully taken SIGINT, IMINT, and radar collections all into outer space. The rest of the 1960s and 70s saw numerous upgrades and improvements. 
Sigint collections improved with Grab and its successor, Poppy. Film collections improved with the high-resolution system Gambit and Hexagon, the wide-area search replacement for Corona. The last piece of the puzzle was to finally make surveillance photography electronically transmittable to Earth. The nation's best engineers worked diligently to increase digital photographic resolution, bandwidth and download speeds, and in 1976, they succeeded. Canon, the world's first high-res electro-optical satellite, made images available to analysts so quickly, the process was called near real-time. The greatest game changer was to go to near real time. It allows us to shorten conflicts, it allows us to do precision strike, it limits collateral damage, it limits casualties on our side and the people we're facing because we have a better knowledge, we have a better understanding of the battle space than our opponents do. The 1970s came to a close with the NRO's surveillance satellites generating the highest quality intelligence products on Earth all available faster than ever, allowing timely decisions and quick responses to world events, and of course, helping to keep America safe. The 1980s were a decade of change and technological breakthroughs for the NRO. Near real-time imagery collections, which began with Canon in 1977, improved in bandwidth and delivery time. And image resolution moved up a notch when the NRO introduced the first-ever charge-coupled device, or CCD arrays on orbit. The NRO historically you know, has worked uh, way out on the technical edge. We use the highest data rates. Uh, charge coupled devices were relatively unknown when we first flew them in the early 80s. In the meantime, the old school film return satellites Gambit and Hexagon continued their missions. Although their ground image resolution had improved dramatically to see objects smaller than 12 inches long from space, the lag time between launch and analysis was just too long. You had a delay because it was a film return system. And by the time you looked at the film, by the time it was brought back, usually it was about a week. Electronic near real-time delivery had the speed, if not the same resolution, but it continued to improve. And soon, the writing was on the wall for Gambit and Hexagon. The 6594th Bucket Catchers Test Group out of Hickam Air Force Base, Hawaii, was tasked with catching the very last bucket of Gambit film in 1984. You know, you're looking at an object that's going about 200 feet a second. I mean, I felt so much pressure. You know, we're the crew, you know, don't mess up, this is your chance. There was so much adrenaline, kind of an intense feeling and going, all right, we got it. The crew who caught the final bucket had witnessed the end of an era. Once it was on board, it said, Mike, you got the airplane. I gotta go back and, you know, touch it. <laughs> <laughs> the film recovery era had ended, and the IC had a new motto. See it all, see it now. I mean, that's clearly the near real-time imaging capability. See it all, see it now. Satellite launches evolved as well. The success of the space shuttle program, which started in the 1970s, opened up new opportunities for delivery of NRO satellites in the 1980s. However, the Challenger failure of 1986 led the NRO to rethink their launch strategies and satellite allotments. Less dependency on the shuttle and a wider range of launch options allowed for more efficient, smaller rockets to deliver smaller satellites, leading to new diverse sensor arrays and satellite constellations. These expanded capabilities proved their worth during the Persian Gulf War of 1991, allowing critical collections under adverse conditions. The United States had established a clear tactical advantage. We, for a number of years, have been in a position to be able to alert folks anywhere in the world, wherever they're in danger, that they're going to be attacked or they're under attack or this is where it came from and so on. 
I said, those are powerful tools. Then, perhaps as no coincidence, the Cold War came to an end. I think all of these systems significantly helped to end the Cold War. You know, I think the Soviets realized that you know, the United States militarily, and, and in particular from an intelligence standpoint, was going to outspend and outinvent them. The post-Cold War era saw a number of changes. The formerly black agency NRO stepped out of the shadows when its existence was publicly acknowledged in 1992. The compartmentalized, independently managed programs A, B, and C were replaced with functional directorates. And groundbreaking for NRO headquarters began in Chantilly, Virginia, to house the consolidated workforce, with construction completed in 1996. The worldwide geopolitical changes led to reprioritization, with a new focus on warfighter support and surveillance of terrorist groups like Al Qaeda. The many technological improvements had not just enhanced our own surveillance capabilities, but benefited commercial systems everywhere. You know, all the commercial imagery systems exist because we release technology that had been built for our classified systems to the commercial uh, users so that they could create a commercial imaging enterprise. The 1990s came to a close with the NRO having achieved robust constellations of signals and imagery collection satellites, space-based data relays, networks of ground stations, and unrivaled information dominance in space. But bigger challenges were yet to come. As the new millennium began and the NRO celebrated its 40th anniversary, few imagined that the NRO mission was about to change abruptly. Yesterday, September 11th, was a tragic day for America. I know you join me in extending our deepest sympathies to those who are the victims of this tragedy. The intelligence community, and in turn the NRO, realized it was time to reassess priorities. Certainly one of the things the NRO learned that day is we were going to have to roll up our sleeves and get in this fight and get relevant against Al-Qaeda. Soon, advances in rocket technology aided in the fight. In the mid-2000s, the Heritage vehicles, Titan IV, uh, Atlas II and Atlas III, as well as Delta II, were all being phased out. The last two NRO payloads flew uh, in 2005. It was the last Titan IV and the last Atlas III. Uh, as the new set of launch vehicles from the EELV program, the Atlas V and the Delta IV, were being phased in. And in late 2006, Boeing and Lockheed joined forces to create the United Launch Alliance. Both of their Atlas and Delta product lines have supported numerous different NRO payloads over the years. They provided a superior product for a very long time, and they've been highly successful for, uh, as a supplier to the NRO. In 2007, the NRO took the fight against terrorism to the battlefield with a critical new life-saving technology called Red Dot alerting troops to the presence of improvised explosive devices, or IEDs. The reason why it's called Red Dot because it puts a red dot on the screen of the soldiers, letting them know that there is something there, an IED is there. The time between detection and notification was drastically reduced. We can take a report off of a highly classified sensor and within 90 seconds get it to appear in a truck downrange in Afghanistan. We're saving lives and is contributing tremendously to the fight of the IED war that we have going on. The next year, the NRO declassified the fact of U.S. ground stations, making public the existence of ADF East, ADF Colorado, and ADF Southwest. Then, 10 years after the 9-11 attacks, the world's most wanted terrorist, Osama bin Laden, was cornered in his compound in Pakistan. Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda. 
What the world did not know at the time was that the NRO satellite constellations made critical contributions to the mission's success. Measurements of the compound gathered by NRO's electro-optical and radar satellite fleet allowed U.S. Special Forces to build an exact replica of the compound for training. That same year, the NRO began some well-deserved 50th anniversary celebrations. All right, in your name. Having been appointed the director of the National Reconnaissance Office. And in 2012, Betty Sapp became the NRO's first woman director, reflecting the increasing diversity of the workforce. The following years saw technological advancements and miniaturization of satellite components, embodied by new additions to NRO satellite constellations, CubeSats. A CubeSat is a satellite in the 1 to 10 kilogram class range. Um, it's a way to get low-cost satellites on orbit fairly quickly. Because CubeSats are so small, able to share rides into space with other payloads, or even with other agencies' rockets, they became valuable options. The idea of rideshare is we just hitch a ride on a bigger spacecraft that has mass, uh, mass availability that can take us to orbit, and we benefit from that. The development of CubeSats has opened new avenues for NRO and private industry launches. So CubeSats are really significantly lower cost, lower risk. If I can provide you a command and control that once you get up there for a marginal cost, now I can fly your mission, then what mission can't I do? What, what customer can't I service? In 2015, the NRO established a permanent cadre of DOD civilians, bolstering the conviction that space was our new battlefield. The NRO and U.S. STRATCOM established the Joint Space Warfighting Forum to provide guidance in this new effort. In 2017, for the first time ever, the NRO partnered with a private rocket provider, SpaceX, to launch mission NROL-76 from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. That was absolutely amazing. First SpaceX launch for our organization. It was great to see the takeoff. It was great to see the relanding. First time ever on a Falcon 9. Look forward to doing more of these. The continuing growth of space exploration and reconnaissance soon led to the first new branch of the United States Uniformed Services in over 70 years, the U.S. Space Force. This is the next and natural evolution of our armed forces. It is absolutely necessary to ensure American supremacy in space. In 2020, the NRO persevered with its mission, and all scheduled launches continued successfully, despite the COVID pandemic. Today, the NRO celebrates 60 years of success, groundbreaking launch technologies, public and private sector partnerships, widespread use of combined multi-intelligence products and tools, innovative acquisitions, leveraging of commercial capabilities, and continuous adapting to new threats and challenges. That's why America congratulates the NRO for 60 very successful years and looks forward to many, many more.